Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Popular Music Books in Process, which is a joint project of the POP Conference, IASPM US, and the Journal of Popular Music Studies. I'm Francesca Royster, and um, we're excited to have you here together. Um, my co-organizers and I, um, Carl Wilson, Kimberly Mack, Gus Stadler, Antonia Randolph, and Eric Weisbard in absentia. So um, you can find our whole calendar of events for the spring on the IASPM website under the Journal of Popular Music Studies tab and get on the mailing list by contacting me, um, froyster at depaul.edu. Um, and that's also where um, you can also catch up on our videos of our past sessions um, on Eric's YouTube channel, which included, which includes last week's session um, by uh, Lee Bitgood and Greg Reich on new dimensions in bluegrass, uh, bluegrass studies. Um, so our next session is going to be just next week on uh, Monday, April 22nd. Mike Gallup and Elliot Powell will be in conversation about the musician as philosopher, New York's vernacular avant-garde. Um, so at our usual time at five o'clock Eastern time. But today we are so excited to have Elijah Wald in conversation with our own Kimberly Mack. Um, about Elijah's new book, Jelly Roll Blues. So I'll tell you a little bit about this. Um, Jelly Roll Blues, Censored Songs and Hidden Histories is an exploration of the censored and hidden worlds of early blues and jazz inspired by Jelly Roll Morton's oral history at the Library of Congress. The book looks at the ways that Black oral culture was preserved and the silences of history, all the things that were not preserved or pre were preserved in distorted forms. It explores the language and culture of the Black sporting world, the extent to which early blues was directed at a female audience and dealt with issues of sexuality that were not being discussed in any other media. And we'll hear so much more about that, I know. Um, the discussion is going to focus on lost narratives, reconstructed histories, and the process of engaging and harnessing such a rich archive, and the complications and messiness of race and authorship. So um, to introduce you to our speakers today, Elijah Wald has been a performing musician since the 1970s and a writer and historian since the 1980s. His dozen or so books include Escaping the Delta, Robert Johnson and the Invention of the Blues, The Dozens, A History of Rap's Mama, um, Dylan Goes Electric, How the Beatles Destroyed Rock and Roll, An Alternative History of American Popular Music, The Mayor of McDougal Street, uh, which was the source of the Coen Brothers Inside Llewellyn Davis, um, and many others. Um, Elijah has a PhD in music, ethnomusicology and sociolinguistics, and his awards include a 2002 Grammy. Um, Kimberly Mack is an associate professor of English at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Her recent book, Living Colors, Time's Up, is part of Bloomsbury's 33 and a Third book series. She's also the author of Fictional Blues, Narrative Self-Invention from Bessie Smith to Jack White from University of Massachusetts Press, Press in 2020, which won the 2021 College English Associations um, of Ohio's Nancy Dasher Award. Uh, Kimberly is writing another book tentatively titled The Untold Story of American Rock Criticism. Um, and um, yeah, I'm going to turn things over to our terrific speakers today. Okay. Um, well, I, I'm realizing I need to start with a shout out to Ned Sublet, who turned me on to the book Silencing the Past by Michel Rolf Trio, the Haitian historian which a lot of sort of the way I'm thinking about this book was informed by his work. And just the idea that basically that the history is always a construction as much of silences as of facts. And in fact, way more of silences than of facts. Actually, when I teach classes, I do a an exercise on day one where I ask somebody to tell me what they did yesterday. 
And then we discuss the fact that what they've just told me is virtually nothing out of all the things they did yesterday. And, and that's all that any history is. Um, this project in particular was inspired. I was living in Los Angeles. I had come out to do some work on Chicano rap. And so I was listening to a lot of rap. This was in 2003. And for the first time, the complete Jelly Roll Morton Library of Congress recordings were released. And that was a session that had been done in 1938 uh, with Jelly Roll Morton and Alan Lomax at the Library of Congress. And it's actually interesting because Morton came to Lomax at the Library of Congress. It was Morton's idea that the library should have his history of jazz because he knew more about that than anybody else. So he initiated the project and they recorded, I forget exactly how much, but over eight hours of material on acetate discs in 1938. And the stuff that fascinated me was a bunch of material that Morton recorded um, of talking about early blues and singing early blues, which he was dating to the first decade of the 20th century. And which we, I had actually heard for the first time along with everybody else over 50 years later in the 1990s, because most of the blues material from those sessions had been hidden away because he used words like fuck. And, um, I want to emphasize a lot of this material was not obscene in the sense of being sexual. Uh, the most interesting to me of the songs that were suppressed was a song that Lomax titled The Murder Ballad. And it's uh, 59 verses over half an hour long and is not complete. Actually, the first, it, it starts in mid song and it's a narrative epic ballad in 12 bar blues form. And it's the only narrative epic ballad in 12 bar blues form that we know of ever. And the fact that the only example of an epic narrative blues ever recorded was suppressed for over 50 years because it was obscene was what got me fascinated. And the fact that because we didn't know it existed, nobody had ever interviewed, had, when they interviewed older musicians, no one had ever asked if they knew anything like that because none of us knew that there'd ever been anything like that. And that got me um, wondering how much else was out there that had been suppressed. And so I started going through archives and looking at um, looking at the original papers of all the folklorists who had first gone into black communities looking for material and white communities, cowboy stuff, sailor stuff, whatever. Um, just trying to figure out how much people had collected and suppressed. Um, and again, I want to emphasize, like in the murder ballad, one of the first verses that's recorded, uh, it's a woman and she's threatening another woman who has been involved with it, her man. And the line, she's saying, uh, I'll cut your throat and drink your fucking blood like wine. Bitch, I'll cut your fucking throat and drink your blood like wine because you know he's a man of mine. I mean, there's not, that's not a sexual verse. It's in fact a verse that could easily be in a gangster rap song, which got, which was an obvious connection for me. And this all, I originally visualized as sort of a roots of rap project and started writing a book, boy, more than a dozen years ago now. And then chapter four of that book metastasized into a book on the dozens. And Nobody bought it, so I put that aside for a little while. And then uh, a few years ago, I decided to pick it up again and do the Jelly Roll Morton part of it. And that's really what this project is. It's I use Jelly Roll Morton um, basically as a through thread to try to look at, first of all, what people were singing at the earliest period of blues 
And the great thing about Jelly Roll Morton in that context is Morton was a professional blues singer and piano player in his teens down along the Gulf Coast in what, as far as I can tell, was the first period of blues uh, as, as sort of a separate kind of song. And, but he quit doing it. By about 1911, he went into vaudeville as a comedian. And a few years after that, he began operating clubs and uh, arranging for bands. And as far as I can tell, had no further interest in blues. So he seems to have paid virtually no attention to um, blues as it was commodified and commercialized and with Ma Rainey, with Bessie Smith, all of that. He seems to have had no interest in that. And his idea of blues seems to be the music that he heard and played before 1911. So it's sort of, it's blues preserved in amper. And one of the interesting things about it is um, he doesn't, for him, it's a completely improvised form. He uses scraps, he uses verses that he had from here or there, but he doesn't seem ever to start a blues knowing what he's going to sing, including the murder ballad, this 59 verse narrative ballad. Clearly a lot of it he's spinning as he goes along. And um, you actually see that in the titles Lomax gives the blues, most of the blues that he recorded. He'll call it like, you know, New Orleans blues, honky tonk blues. Um, I forget all the titles, low down blues. It's all generic. And that's very much how Morton seems to have understood blues and how other people of his generation talked about it. So the way I organized the book was I took a few key songs of Morton's, used them as hooks, and then looked at all the related songs I could find in the archives. And then tried to do the next step of figuring out, so who were the people singing these songs? Who were they singing them for? What was the world they came out of? And who were the people collecting them? What were they suppressing? Why? How were they changing the stuff they collected for publication? How did their filter change what how blues was understood and what it became? So sort of trying to simultaneously explore what blues was like in its earliest years and the world that it came out of and explore all the filters between it and us. So that seems like a fair introduction. What do you think, Kim? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, we can start our conversation. So, uh, well, first of all, you know, I love this book. So I'm really excited to get to talk to you about it. And, you know, the stuff that you're exploring in here, you know, questions of stories and storytelling and narrative and even constructed histories and hidden histories, all of this is stuff that I'm interested in in my work. So I'm excited to ask the first question. Um, so I find it compelling that in your book, Jelly Roll Morton serves as our guide throughout this narrative, given that his narrative reliability has been called into question previously. Um, why is Morton the right character through which to tell this story in Jelly Roll Blues? Um, I mean, I think the first two answers are that he the, the the Library of Congress recordings he did is, is the first great oral history of blues or jazz. And by some definitions, the first oral history period. I mean, it's the first recorded oral history we have. Um, it was the beginning of that whole form. Secondly, he's a gorgeous storyteller. I mean, he's just a really fun person to follow. I mean, the way that man used language is just astonishing. There's, a, you know, everything he talks about, it's vivid. He brings it to life. He's eloquent. Um, he's just a terrific storyteller. I mean, he was a great talker. Everyone remembered that about him, some with irritation, most with amusement. As for his reliability, um, I'm not going to go down the whole 
Morton W. C. Handy battle, which which I do go into in the book in in quite a lot of detail. Um, but that really was what hurt his reputation in terms of reliability. That he wrote, he was irritated by uh, Ripley's "Believe It or Not" radio show that crowned W. C. Handy as the originator of blues and jazz, and wrote a letter, uh, an open letter to Ripley published in downbeat and also in the in the pittsburgh um what is the pittsburgh paper the black paper oh god i'm losing all of my proper names in any case it was published a number of places in which he said that he himself had invented jazz in 1902 and he has been being courier thank you sonnet um pittsburgh courier and um, but people have been giggling about Jelly Roll Morton claiming to have personally invented jazz in 1902, ever since this would have been like 1939. Uh, first of all, Jelly Roll Morton, if, if anybody had fair claim, Jelly Roll Morton was certainly on the list. I mean, he's one of the great originators in jazz. But the other thing is, if you read the whole letter, uh, he's very careful to start listing all the people who were already playing blues in New Orleans when he came up. I mean, it's not that Jelly Roll Morton claimed to have done everything himself. What he did claim was that New Orleanians had done everything, but he was very happy to credit other New Orleanians and to say, I got this from Buddy Bolt and I got that from Tony Jackson. I got that from a third person. Um, so that's part of it. The other part of it is just, I think, reliability. Um, let's put it this way. If I've got a period newspaper from 1905 versus somebody telling me their memory of what happened in 1905, the difference in terms of reliability, as I know that the person writing, that what I'm reading in the newspaper really was written by someone in 1905. And I don't know that the person describing their memory really is remembering something from 1905. But that doesn't mean what was written in the newspaper is more accurate than what the person is remembering. It just means that I can rely on it being somebody's opinion from that moment rather than in hindsight. But I think, you know, what I try to do as much as possible is to give a sense of all the different kinds of testimony I'm working with rather, and the problems and advantages of all the different kinds of testimony I'm working with rather than trying to figure out what happened, which is to say my own testimony of what happened in 1905 when I promise you I was not around. Um, and I think it's just richer that way. I mean, I think it's much more interesting to think about the past as a whole accumulation of different voices talking to us rather than mining all those voices and trying to pretend that one has come up with the er version that they're all describing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, what you just said reminded me that in the book you refer to Jelly Roll Morton's oral history as memoir. And I'm curious if- I refer to it as what? Oh, Jelly Roll Morton's oral history as memoir. Yeah. At some point in the book, you call it that. So uh -huh. I'm curious if that has something to do with the, the storytelling and the ways in which he- goes about telling these tales because they're they're part obviously musical history mm. but also very personal and also a way of as you mentioned recuperating his own image yeah. and making sure his legacy is there oh yeah no i mean i think it's whether one uses the word memoir or not i mean what he is doing is a performance mm -hmm. there you know there is no moment as far as I could tell, Jelly Roll Morton had no waking moment when he was not aware of an audience. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was an extremely performative person if there was one other human being in the room, and maybe if there wasn't. 
Um, and certainly what he was doing on those records at the Library of Congress was very consciously thought out and was very much the story he was choosing to tell. There are moments when Lomax pushes him into talking about stuff that maybe he didn't want to talk about, but his agreement is immediate. Well, perfect example is the language. Um, I mean, I've said I was fascinated by all this stuff that was suppressed. Uh, he sings songs that use words like fuck and cunt and all sorts of words. Um, never does he use those words speaking. And never, even in a song, does he use the N-word. I mean, he is very, very conscious in what he's doing. And a good example of that is there's a moment when he almost uses the N-word. He referred, and you can hear it in his speech. He, there's a pause. He, he refers to a, a bouncer in a club or manager of a club in Memphis as being known as the toughest Negro in Memphis. And that pauses, at least that's how I read that pause. Um, so yeah, I think it's very, very much a constructed performance by a brilliant performer. And I mean, a man who was known. I, the thing that we forget with particularly someone like Jelly Roll Morton is what we have on records is just the music. But what he was known as, as much as a musician, was a presenter. I mean, he ran nightclubs, he ran bands, he worked as an MC, he worked as a comedian in vaudeville. He was a professional talker. Yeah. Can we, actually, this is a perfect segue into this conversation about constructed histories. Um, so we could talk about Morton and why he's the right character to think about the larger story about American musical histories that how they've been constructed. But I'm also curious about how you are navigating all the different constructed histories in your book, because you have the constructed histories of the black, uh, you know, black folks in the oral tradition. And then you have the constructed histories of the outsiders who've written down, you know, these kinds of stories, but omitted things and misinterpreted, etc. So how are you managing all of those different histories? Um, some people I undoubtedly will say poorly. Um, I mean, one thing that I realized early on on this is that when you're looking at censorship, which I was looking at it in a way as much as I was looking at the material itself, um, you first walk in saying, boy, there's really a problem. They're censoring all this stuff. And then at least for me, there was a second realization of, wait a minute, they're telling you they're censoring all this stuff. And if people are telling you what they're censoring, that's actually really useful for understand, you know, for reading through what they've left you and figuring out what may, might be missing. Um, so I was really interested in looking at clearly at Morton's process, at the process of the other black performers of his time and, and white performers in, not in as much detail, but as well, but also very much looking at the folklorists and the other people um, and trying to get a sense of who they were, how they were constructing this. And I have to say, um, the Lomaxes have been criticized an awful lot, uh, and much of the criticism, okay, is justified. But one thing they were terrific about is preserving everything and making it all accessible. I mean, you we have all of Alan Lomax's field notebooks. We have a lot of John Lomax's, his father's, original handwritten and typed transcriptions and notes and letters and everything. So reconstructing their process um, is much easier than with pretty much any other folklorist. And you can actually, you know, look at how Alan Lomax, perfect example, you can look at the way he presented so a song in a songbook 
you can look at the way he wrote about his process of creating the version in the songbook. And you can look at the notes he actually took on the ground when he was collecting it. And so you can watch how things got transformed in that process. And in the book, I try to do that along with trying to understand. I mean, to me, the process of history is trying to understand what people are doing in their moment. Um, I, yeah, it, to me, it's all about, that's the exercise, is understand, to me, I, I wrote in How the Beatles, um, to me, that's the essential difference between history and criticism. And I feel a lot of what's called music history is actually music criticism. It's people trying to, you know, listening to things and saying how they are reacting to them. Whereas I think history is exactly the opposite of that. It's you're doing your best to understand how other people are reacting. And I was trying to understand as much as I could both the people creating and the audience and and how the folklorists and the commercial people and whatever. And I should mention also the folklorists overwhelmingly are white, male, and middle class, but not entirely. I mean, thank God, you know, we also have Zora Neale Hurston going over a lot of the same ground. And a number, she's the only black female folklorist going over that ground, but there are a number of other female folklorists and a few black male folklorists and also some white male folklorists collecting in white communities material that then gives you, at least for me, suggests how much richer things would be if we had more black folklorists who had been collecting that early in in their own black communities, because that's another problem. You have middle-class black folklorists going into working class communities and coming up with things like John Wesley work, the first John Wesley work, saying that there was no black sec secular music. It was all religious, mm -hmm. um, which simply wasn't true. But we, you know, then you try to understand why he'd be saying that. Right. which is not hard. <laughs> okay. Um, so I want to I want to talk to you about the women in your yep. book. Um, I really, really appreciate the, the power and agency that Black women have in this book and their stories. Um, so there's a character called Ready Money, who yes. is fascinating. I was wondering yes. if you could say a little more about the ways in which Black women existed at the center of these early blues narratives and were the core audience for the blues. Sure. And why is this um, important? Sure, there are, again, there are a whole bunch of things. But one thing, first of all, it's not simply Black women. It is, in many cases, specifically sex workers. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first thing I, will, I should say on that is that there's some arguments about whether one should say sex worker or prostitute. But in the case of this project, it was easy to make that choice because so many of the songs are not about the sex, they're about the work. I mean, so many of the songs are about the problems of like walking the streets on a rainy night. That's not about sex, that's just about the work end of it. And there also are songs about the economics um, one thing that I noticed was I was one of part of this project. Thank God there are hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of interviews with early New Orleans jazz musicians. And huge amounts of that are on tape. So you actually can get it's not unmediated because obviously there were white men in the room who were asking the questions and running the tape but it's unmediated to the extent that you can actually hear the voices. Um, and one thing that, and actually Louis Armstrong also created reams of, of typed memoir. Um, Louis Armstrong always traveled with a typewriter back to when he first left New Orleans and he was, and he would sit in his dressing room typing. He just turned out reams of material. 
And one thing everybody says, they don't necessarily make a point of it, but the word blues in the earliest memories over and over and over is described as what they would play um, after hours for the women, specifically in the district, um, uh, which I should say, I, I do say in the book, the term Storyville was a tourist term. Um, several black musicians who worked around New Orleans later said they'd never even heard that term until they got to New York. Everyone called it the district. And there were actually two districts. There was that one which catered to white customers. And then there was one that catered to both black and white customers. That was the other side of Canal Street, um, as well as a house that I write about that was in between the two women, uh, Eloise Blankenstein and Louise Abadie ran that was for the black middle class. But anyway, what they say over and over is that that's when you played blues, that blues was what they played for the women when they got off work after the Johns had gone home. Um, and if you, after hearing that over and over and then looking at the lyrics, it makes perfect sense. A huge proportion of early blues um, does seem to be woman-centered, including the stuff that uses the filthiest language. Um, and, you know, the subjects tend to be lesbianism and cunnilingus. I mean, it's very much if you were a prostitute who'd just been dealing with men professionally, it's it's the sex you might want to hear about on your time off. And, of course, Angela Davis and any number of people have written about how later blues recordings were overwhelmingly for a female market. And that's true today. I mean, if you go to a blues show, to something build as a blues show for a black audience, it will still tend to be 80% women in the room. Um, that's always been the main audience. As to ready money, yeah. Um, once I was thinking along those lines, I also got to thinking more and more about women like Eloise Blankenstein and Louise Abadie and these names who are completely missing from histories not only of jazz, but of New Orleans, of the red light district of Chicago. Fortunately, the last few years, there have been some terrific histories, all of them by Black women, of the Black sporting world. I mean, Sadia Hartman is the most, is the best known, but there are a half dozen people who've, women who've written really terrific books about that world. But Ready Money was a woman who, she's mentioned by Jelly Roll Morton, uh, as an expert pickpocket who's, who was with a man named Bob Rowe, who ran the gambling at the Big 25, which was a club in the district. And I never expected to be able to find much more about her, but God damn it, once I went into the newspapers, it turned out she was nationally famous. Um, I mean, there's only a page and a half about her in the book, but by now I've written over 40 pages about her. I am working on something longer about her uh, because she, by the time she showed up in New Orleans, to, long story short, she had already been arrested. Uh, first of all, in, uh, in St. Louis, where she'd been involved with a woman named Betty Ray, who ended up being the one of the great black madams in St. Louis, who supposedly Scott Joplin played in her house. Uh, she was, Ready Money was then arrested in St. Louis after having pulled off a robbery with another woman in New York of $7,000 in 1897, which is a lot of goddamn money in 1897. Then Chicago, she's in the papers in Portland, Oregon. She's in New Orleans for six years running her own house of prostitution on uh, Yenville Street. And then she and Barbara went off to San Diego. And by 1930, she was sole owner of the largest black owned hotel between LA and Tijuana with a nightclub downstairs and a staff of 60 people. And, on, and there has never been more than a sentence written about her. And I mean, she went, hers is a more colorful story than some, but Part of the point I was just trying to make by I have a section where I, I give a, several biographies of, of women um, 
who have never been written about and who were remembered by everyone in New Orleans as much, much more significant characters than any musician. They, these were the people who hired and fired musicians. These were the stars. These were the dominant figures in that world. And because that world has always been written about either by jazz fans or by white men fantasizing about being, you know, about merry nights down in the district, um, they just have been completely ignored. So I was both saying this was a or the significant audience for the music. And let's try to actually, you know, give them their place and, and center them in the narrative. Were there any other women that you came across that you just couldn't fit into the book? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, first of all, there were a number of names that I came across multiple times, but never really came across more than that they were important in that world. And I couldn't find any stories. Um, there also were some stories of, I, there's a guy named Creole George Guénon, who I, I quote a few times in the book, another wonderful raconteur, a little younger than Jelly Roll. Uh, he was a, a guitar and banjo player. And he has this beautifully written story about this woman who um, actually killed her cheating boyfriend in the big 25, shot him and then uh, knelt over his body, beating out his teeth with the butt of the pistol while singing It's a Long Way to Tipperary. Um, but it's a much longer piece and, and elegantly written. And I really, really wanted to fit it in. And Guénon actually wrote like a, I forget how many pages, but like a 50 page Memories of Storyville kind of thing that has a number of other stories. I mean, a huge part of this book for me was just trying to point a big arrow at all of this material and say, there is a lot more of this stuff. Anybody wants to go down this road, there's plenty to do. Okay. I mean, Bob Mc Robert McKinney, who I bring up in one of the chapters, who is one of my huge sources, um, the one black writer with the, in the main office of the Federal Writers Project in New Orleans, who wrote over 200 articles. Nothing has been published under his name ever. And I'm right now shopping a collection of Robert McKinney's writings. Um, I mean, there is an awful lot of stuff, of incredible stuff um, that, yeah. Again, it, I think of this book as a big, you know, anybody wants to say that I'm not the right person to be doing this project, all I can say is there's plenty more of this project to do, go at it. Well, that, that's great. Let's talk more about the archive. Uh, I'm just, I'm really, I, I think people would be interested in hearing how you engage such a rich archive like this. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in your decision-making process. You know, how did you decide, you know, what's in the book and what yeah, is what's in the book, what's not in the book. I mean, at some point you talked about in the book, you said that you mentioned um, that there was a, a specific verse from Vance Randolph's collection of unprintable Ozark folklore that you said you didn't want to put in the book. So yeah. were there other lyrics that gave you pause like that? No. Um, I mean, my initial thought was this is a book where I'm trying to peel away layers of censorship and I didn't want to add my own layer of censorship. So by and large, I tried to be as transparent as possible and to print everything uncensored with the original orthography as best I could. Um, the one verse I didn't print, I actually had in one draft and it just, it, it sickened me. And I found my, it was, it was, it, it, it was about, it was racist and misogynistic. It was not that it was particularly dirty but it had a neat rhyming scheme that had it sticking in my head like an earworm and I didn't want it in my head like an earworm. And after a while I decided I really wished I didn't have it in my head and I wasn't gonna put it in someone else's. Um, 
but I do highlight that where they can where people can find it if they want to go through Vance Randolph stuff. I'm not, you know, it it's all out there. That collection is an amazing collection. Um, that's the one collection that exists from somebody who really, really tried to get everything. He wasn't looking for dirty folklore. He wanted the stuff that I'm calling dirty to simply be part of his seven volume collection of Ozark folklore, but the publisher wouldn't let him use it. So all the rest of it got published in two separate huge volumes. But for example, it includes 11 pages of filthy square dance calls. Um, we would not know there was such a thing as filthy square dance calls were it not for Vance Randolph. There are no other calls like that collected. Um, so, you know, also I use stuff like that because once you got that, those are all from white callers. But so then did black callers do that? And then you start noticing that people talk about how black callers, you know, guys in Mississippi, when they get drunk, they'd say just about anything, use all kinds of words. And you go, okay, so yeah, that was happening there too. It's just nobody preserved it. But if I hadn't known about the Vance Randolph stuff, I wouldn't have been able to read those comments and understand them. Um, more generally, you know, you go to archive after archive after archive, and one thing mentions another thing, and then you try to go there. And you have to have a lot of time on your hands and you have to have ways to do the traveling. And I mean, some of that as an academic, one can fit in or as a touring musician, one can fit in. Um, I mean, this was very much the kind of project that if I wasn't personally fascinated, it would have been impossible. I mean, you know, for every verse that is in the book, I saw not only hundreds of verses, but hundreds of pages. I mean, I, I went through every single song in the Lomax song files in the Library of Congress. I forget that, something like 30 folders. Which actually leads to another funny, oh, and also infinite time going through old newspapers. Where, you know, you do a search for a name, you find all the examples of the name, then you find all the addresses that go with the name. Then you do searches for the addresses and start finding articles where the name didn't get scanned properly. So it's there, but it's not in the search. And then you search all the other people named because they sometimes it's, you know, it's very, very time consuming. But if you like doing but, you know, it's fun if you're somebody who thinks that's fun, which I am. Um, there's other interesting problems uh all the early folklorists the lomaxes among them but most of them marked their obscene material so you could have gone through the card catalog and found that stuff the problem is that they marked it with a triangle the delta it was it was a delta file sometimes it would be a file a manila file with just a triangle on it problem is all of this stuff has been entered now into electronic databases by people who don't know what that triangle is. So they didn't mention it. So all the stuff that you could have found by going through the old card catalogs or files, you can't find anymore. Um, yeah. You also, in the beginning of the book, you lay out some of your uh, methods for handling some of the words like the N word and I'm just curious if we could just talk a little bit about the politics behind some of the things you were doing there. And also just, you know, we can have a begin our conversation a bit about your subjectivity and just sure how you dealt with all that. Um, you know, I think we're all of us wrestling with this stuff in our classes, what you talk about and how you talk about it. And you know, some of them, certainly I've been affected by my students. I don't do all that much teaching, but I've done enough that people have called me out for some of the things I've done. And I've learned how to, I hope, do them better. Um, I mean, example of the N word and, and the other words in the book, you know, my essential position is I'm not censoring other people. Uh, for my own politics, um, 
you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very conscious of my own positionality. I mean, I'm very, I try to write as a white middle-class male, 65 years old. And I try to make it clear that that's who I am. Um, I mean, my, yeah, my position on the N-word is I absolutely am not going to censor it when it shows up in writing. And also, I mean, I maintain everybody's orthography at every level because I I want that when I'm reading other people's work. I mean, I read, there's a writer on New Orleans stuff who I was reading a while ago, who every time she comes across the N-word, she substitutes in brackets, gentlemen. I don't find that helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I respect it. I don't, you know, I, and she doesn't have a note explaining that that's what she's doing. I just happen to know because I've gone over the same original sources she's do she's looking at. Um, that I have problems with. I mean, what I'm trying to do is make my choices and be absolutely transparent about how I'm making those choices. So if someone disagrees with me, at least they know what I'm doing and can do their own correction. And I have to say, you know, in, in classes, and we've had a con we were just having a conversation about this a couple of days ago. My experience is I love trigger warnings. I don't understand why anybody has a problem with them. Um, my experience is that I know a lot of academics right now who feel like there are things you can't talk about in class, be it race, be it gender, be it Gaza. And my experience is that my students are very eager, borderline desperate, to have conversations about all of those things. They just want to have those conversations in situations where people are going to talk to each other reasonably respectfully and listen to each other and where they can ask the questions that they think of as scary questions and people will respond in a reasonably respectful and polite manner. And that nobody's actually trying to avoid those conversations. They just want to be respected. That's my take. Maybe I've been lucky, but it's worked so far for me. Yes. And as we discussed, that's been, a, that's been my experience as well. Um, well, continuing along this line, thinking about your positionality, and of course, your book critiques the ways in which history, um, early early blues history has been filtered through, you know, a white male, largely middle-class lens. Um, um, I'm gonna say it examines it. it I'm gonna be it. very careful on that one. Okay. So how do you grapple with your own positionality as you were writing this? As I say, just by trying to be as transparent as possible about it. Um, I. You know, Joe Schloss, uh, in in uh, in his book on production, uh, you know, his ethnography of, of hip hop production. In the introduction, he has a, a thing where he says, "You know, I I'm not conscious of my own blind spots. If I was, they wouldn't be blind spots." Um, I think the best you can do is try to be transparent about your politics. You know, I mean, I do this also, again, back to my students. I I tell people up front, you know, that I'm, I'm a red and I'm an anti-Zionist and I'm this, that, the other, and that I will respect their position if they disagree with any of that. But I don't think it's useful to pretend you don't have opinions. Um, what's useful is to let people know what your opinions are so they can filter everything you say through that information. So that's what I try to do. Um, and I should say, you know, this book, I am dealing, you know, I am a white male. I am writing very, very much about Black stuff. I am writing very much about stuff that I know some people would rather was not being written about, much less being written about by me. 
Um, and that's the other part of this, that I understand that it's problematic. I mean, you know, when people say you can't say such and such anymore, the answer is yes, you can, but you have to understand that some people will think that you're doing, you know, that some people will object, that some people will think you're being an asshole when you do it uh, or whatever else. And you, and, you know, that makes sense to me. I mean, absolutely honestly, if I picked up this book and saw it was by a white male, I would find that problematic. So it doesn't bother me that other people do. That seems appropriate. Okay. <laughs> you know? On, so if you then said, so why do you do it? So I do it because no one else was doing it. And I, I would love to have this picked up by other people. And this is a good moment to mention that actually the audio book, yes. um, I had for the first time ever the option of auditioning the people to do the audio book. And I said, whoever it was had to be black mm -hmm. just because some of the, the code switching and the language would just sound, it would be utterly inappropriate to have a white person reading some of those, but did not have to be male. And I ended up with a woman named Melo Lee, who I just think is terrific. And she showed up, I invited her when I was in LA to come to the reading. And we just sat down and just did a back and forth. And it was so much fun. And she, um, she's just been trying to get more history and background on her own family's background in Mississippi. Her grandmother is still alive in her 90s and, and was from a family that was doing sharecropping. And so she had some very direct reactions to the book. And that was really exciting. And she reads it beautifully. This is a case where I recommend the audiobook. Mm -hmm. um, I think the book is stronger read by Mello Lee than just reading my words on the page. Well, I told you, Elijah, you know what? I happened to be listening to it just in a really busy day and I was looking at emails and I thought, okay, I'm just going to have it in the background while I'm responding to emails. And then I just had to stop after the first line and just pay, give all of my attention to the audio book. Yeah, she's really she's, good. She is really, really good. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, we should probably open it up to, I think, Q&A at this point. How does that sound, Carl? Yeah, let's do it. Um, and I, I should add one other thing. Melalee yeah. says that she has lots of frequent flyer miles and is interested in doing future things. So if someone has a conference where you want to have the two of us come in and talk about doing a project like this and then what it's like to be the reader, she's up for it as well. That's awesome. <laughs> That's great. Um, thank you both so much for this conversation so far. It's been fascinating. Um, we have a few questions already, but um, we have room for more. So if you're out there and things have been rattling around in your head, um, just say so in the chat. Um, but the first one we have is from um, Jacob Bloomfield. Jacob, do you want to unmute and ask? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, uh, thank you very much uh, for a great talk. I'm also a white guy uh, researching black history. So uh, with apologies for that. Um, but uh, yeah, my project that I'm working on right now is about Little Richard. Um, actually just the other day I was uh, looking at a, a queer black magazine from the 1980s that had arti artistic representations of various um, queer black luminaries and uh, such as James Baldwin, James Baldwin, uh, Billy Strayhorn. And uh, on the back yeah. cover, there's an artistic representation of Little Richard next to Jelly Roll Morton. I wasn't aware that Jelly Roll Morton had relationships with men. Maybe he did, and if you want to. Uh, but uh, this uh, person clearly saw them as a queer sure. black figure. Um, so uh, that's just a bit of synchronicity. Um, I also, you discussed this before, but feel free to add any more. Um, in my research, for example, there's that famous story about the smuttier, earlier lyrics to Tutti Frutti and speaking- Tutti Frutti, um, you can grease it, make it easy, yeah. Right, yes. And um, uh, 
you know, also speaking of sort of competing narratives, some people say no black people were listening to those smuttier lyrics. It was purely for, uh, <laughs> yeah, you sure. know, a white frat boy crowd. And then you have some mm -hmm. people say, no, this was for a black insider audience. Some of them say it was for a gay insider audience. Sure. This would have been in the 1950s, so later than maybe the period you're looking at. But um, yeah, I'm just interested in um, who were the smuttier, you said, you know, women and sex workers, but, you know, uh, so were the, was this an after sure. hour thing? Was this often a sort of more casual, casual song sung between friends, maybe, you know, people who knew one another, or was this something that you could witness if you were an outsider walking into the Blues Club. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. A lot of, lot of, lot of good material there. And I'm going to try to be not too not brief. Um, for the gay stuff, uh, someone else I saw was chiming in asking about Tony Jackson. Tony Jackson, who was Jelly Roll Morton's absolute hero, was openly gay. Uh, he left New Orleans for Chicago fairly early, according to Jelly Roll Morton, because Chicago was a more accepting environment for that. I do have a fairly long section about blues and uh, gay audiences, but part of what I say in that section is that one of the huge holes in the scholarship is uh, early gay New Orleans. Um, there are really good studies by now of gay life by the turn of the 20th century in Chicago and New York. There's nothing on New Orleans, which is just bizarre. It was it was already a gay center. And the, the only reason there's nothing is because nobody's done that book. And I wish somebody would do that book. Um, I did a certain amount of, of original research, found some stuff, but I'm sure there's infinitely more. As for who's the audience and the insiders and outsiders, um, I tried as best I could to unravel that, but that's one of the big questions. Um, there unquestionably uh, blues using words like fa, um, that's not necessarily dirty blues. As I said at the beginning, it's just until blues was commodified, until any of this, until any working class culture was commodified, it used the language that people used. So that, you know, all cowboy songs, all sailor songs, all soldier songs, um, if you get a collection that doesn't have the sort of words that men use around bars, you've got a censored collection and women use around bars. Um, so, I mean, that that's very clear. That's very clear that, you know, people were using, using barroom language in songs. It also is very clear that by the earliest period, there were, there was a white audience for um, stereotyped black, sexual, violent, outrageous material. I mean, the equivalent of the ghetto boys um, was being marketed to the equivalent of the white suburban teenager already in minstrel days. I mean, minstrel shows did midnight shows that were absolutely filthy already in the 19th century with black and blackface performers working for white audiences doing smutty material. And there are situations where I can say with some confidence, I'm looking at stuff that black people sang for black people, or with some kind of confidence, I'm looking for, I'm looking at white fantasies of black sex. But there also are lots of situations where I'm not sure which I'm looking at. And it I think it's a mistake to, well, I know it's a mistake to over-separate Black and white culture because they're in constant interaction. I mean, if you want a magnificent example, LaWanda Page uh, in her records in the 1970s, which are brilliantly, 
funny and filthy and definitely for a, were for a black audience. There's a Scottish song called The Ball at Kerimur, which was a famous Scottish filthy ballad, which she does as a Pentecostal sermon. Um, and it's absolutely brilliant. It's a transformation. If you didn't know it was the ball at Kerimur, you had would have no idea that this was Scottish culture. So, you know, again, I, I try to be as transparent as possible about the messiness, but there aren't easy answers. And particularly for the male gay stuff, there's a lot of female gay blues culture that got preserved. But Tony Jackson apparently used to entertain at a place called The Frenchman's, which Morton talks about, which was a very popular club. And there are any number of memories of it being a place that was frequented by his crowd. Um, the Cooks, apparently the Cooks in the New Orleans, in the district were known, that was a gay male job. And what he sang for them, I don't know. Um, I mean, his most famous song, Pretty Baby, um, the term jelly roll was typically a term for, for vulva or vagina. And apparently Tony Jackson's original lyric for Pretty Baby remembered by at least two other pe two people who, who recalled the way he used to sing it before it was published. The original lyric was, uh, you can talk about your jelly rolls, but none of them compare with my baby, who presumably was male. Um, but I have no idea how much further it went or who else was in. We don't have names of any entertainers in that world. But I mean, we do have plenty of evidence that there were already male cross-dressing entertainers and clubs and gay clubs in the district. Uh, so I assume that there's a huge body of material that either hasn't survived or that I haven't found. Great, thank you. Um, David Sussman, I know that some aspects of your question were touched on along the way, but I'm sure you have ways that you can Spin it. So, um, are you still there, David? To ask? Yes, I am. And uh, yeah, Elijah, you did, as as uh, Carl was suggesting, you touched on a bunch of this stuff. But I'm really interested in the process uh, of filtering, the process of censorship, and the traces that it leaves. And mm -hmm. um, in in my own research on uh, soldiers and music in the military, I've come across. Um, a fair number of collections or articles about this music that uh, in which the, the collector or the folklorist acknowledges explicitly Absolutely. that they are doing a lot of censoring. Yeah. They are, they say this, this is an incredibly rich body of song and most of it I can't, I can't publish. Absolutely. And I, sometimes I they constantly. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so this is, this is, so this is, you know, in effect, my question, I mean, they, they sometimes give uh uh, excuses. They say, oh, well, I can't publish this for running for fear of running afoul of censorship laws. Or sometimes they just say it's, you know, yeah. improper. But um, I was wondering if you could just expand on the sure. uh, that sort of middle level of censorship where sure. the censor is calling out themselves. Sure. Um, one other thing I'll say is there are actually some soldier songs is as far as I can tell, the only area where you also have large numbers of collections uncensored printed up by soldiers themselves. And if you're interested, I can steer you to some if you haven't found them. I, I got times. Um, okay, I figured. Um, whereas sailor songs, for example, we have almost nothing. And cowboy songs, slightly more, but not much. Military, we got lots. Um yeah, I mean, I found infinite numbers of of people saying that they couldn't, uh, you know, that they'd found stuff they couldn't print back to John Lomax in his childhood. And, you know, to people who uh, say they've censored this song and that song and the other song and then name a couple of other songs, that there wasn't any point in censoring them because the obscenity was so integral to the song that there was nothing they could do with them. You also have quite a lot of examples of people talking about things singers wouldn't sing for them. Um, there's a woman named Mary Wheeler who did a collection of black songs from the Mississippi. Who She has a moment where she talks about, you know, going up to a man who, 
who said, well, oh yeah, I know lots of them old Rouster songs, but nothing I'd sing for a nice lady like you. Um, so there's a lot of self-censorship as well. And yeah, I mean, I, I quote infinite examples and more in the footnotes and there are more that I don't quote um, of exactly that. I mean, the, the clues are all over the place to what you're not seeing. And there are some people who are very transparent. I mean, there there is uh, the Texas, one of the earliest collections from the Texas Folklore Journal. I forget what they called it. Something like that. Journal of Texas Folklore. Um, there's a guy, one of the guys um, has a song where he has a certain number of bowdlerized verses where he marks with an asterisk the words that he has put in to substitute for words he isn't putting in. Um, which I wish more people had done. Uh, John Lomax, for example, when he bowdlerized, just bowdlerized. And fortunately, though, John Lomax kept his originals on file, so you can find them. Um, but, I mean, sailor songs in particular. I My introduction, I, I talk a bunch. I follow a, the term hog eye from 12 Years a Slave, which is the first place I have found it in print, but became a very, very popular sailor song that right down through history, um, everybody includes a mention at least of it and every single one of them explains they can't give the verses. Thanks. I did finally find an uncensored version incidentally, but it hasn't been published either. A lot of the stuff in this book hasn't been published. To be fair, a lot of the stuff in this book is just stupid. Um, I mean, I tried to give samples, but you know, dirty songs get dull rather quickly. So I was not, you know, I'm not fascinated by dirty songs. What fascinated me was using that as a thread that if I pulled at it, I would find all sorts of other stuff. Um, Great, thank you. Thanks, David. That's that's a good bridge into Franklin Bruno's question. Um, he's in a library right now, so he can't unmute and ask. So I'm going to ask for him. Um, but he had basically a sort of research process question, which is given how deep all of these wells go, and especially in cases he was saying where um, there might be a lot of writing about things already, but from contradictory points of view. Um, how do you decide where to stop? How do you decide when you have the material that you can use to write what you want to write? And, and how do you prevent yourself from continually going down all of the alleyways? Um, well, I mean, one answer is I've got, I don't remember exactly, 40 some pages of footnotes. And the footnotes include not only sources, but some verses that I thought interrupted the flow of what I was writing, but that I wanted to include for people to look at. Um, I mean, there are quite a lot of verses in the footnotes, uh, particularly in examples where like, you know, I had found five variants of the same verse and I wanted people to be able to look at a couple of the others. But I mean, I'm a, I think one of the skills I bring to the work I do is I am a pretty unforgiving reader of my own writing. I get bored pretty goddamn fast rereading re my manuscripts and rather quickly reach the point of going, oh God, you've said that three times, take two of those out. Um, I mean, you know, my basic view is if people, you know, anything, I, I want the book to be read. Um, this one I feel like is, more academic than I would like it to be. That's one of the reasons I love having it read by Mela Lee. I know f I, I've had at least one person so far say they found it a little dry on the page. And then when she started reading it, it came alive. God bless her. Um, but I mean, I think the simple answer is you want people to read it. So you, you eliminate everything that interrupts the flow or you try to. And the stuff that you need to eliminate but think should be available, you stick in footnotes. And the other stuff, 
Um, I have lots of stuff that is neither in the book nor in the footnotes. And, you know, it's all available. Anybody wants to look into this, I'm happy to start sharing. Other people were really good about doing that with me, and I'm happy to do that with other people. I mean, I guess what the aspect of Franklin's question, I feel like, but in covering is also just in the research process. How do you decide that you've gone to enough archives that you've gone to, you know, what, where did you oh, draw those lines? Oh, sure. You've never gone to enough archives. <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, seriously. Um, I mean, perfect example on this project. If I really, really had wanted to do it right, um, the Kinsey archive has been closed all the time I've been doing this project. And I am absolutely sure that there is stuff there that would have enriched this project. And I tried and tried and tried, and I finally just had to say, okay, you know, I'm not, that's not gonna be in here. Um, but clearly there's stuff there. Um, there are, you know, again, the tapes in New Orleans, I said, I listened to hours and hours and hours of tapes, but there's one guy, Manuel Manetta, who there are probably 30 hours of tape of him. I have not listened to all 30 hours. I've listened to maybe five. Um, you know, I, I drew the line basically when I was reaching enough of a diminishing return situation. But I've been sort of working off and on on this project for a dozen years. I've been to most of the places I wanted to go. And I've amassed way the hell more than is in this book and than I will probably ever use. And when I know I'm not going to use it anymore, it all ends up at UNC, which is where I put my papers when I'm not using them anymore. Thanks. Um, Xavier, um, you, I, the, a bunch of what you were asking about on queer content was definitely addressed, but it seems like you might have other angles you want to talk about. Are you still there, Xavier? Yes, I'm here. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Woo! Solid. The audio is working in this office. Uh, um, thank you for the great talk. I'm actually still waiting for my copy of the book, and I'm even more excited to read it now. Um, yeah, you kind of already answered most of the questions I was thinking about with queerness and kind of Morton's discussion of it with Lomax, but I guess the kind of pivot it in a different direction. Um, one of the things I noticed in my own research, um, trying to complete my dissertation, is that there is like this clear gap with uh, men's, uh, Black men's queerness in the early 20th century. Um, and so one of the things I was wondering was, particularly in the district in New Orleans, uh, as you were coming across these things in your research, where, hmm, so I'm trying to figure out the best way to phrase this question um and it might have been out of the scope of your book but how where did you sort of see these queer songs where they did exist where were they being played was it more so in the after hours joints were they in the on the floor shows with the um, naked dancers yeah he talks about where were, were sort of these songs played um Answer. yeah uh Again, there are a lot of different layers. There were gay clubs, I and they were gay clubs where people like Tony Jackson hung out, where I assume he was singing material for a Black gay male audience, simply because, I mean, he was an entertainer, and I know the audience was there in those clubs. Uh, by the 19, what is it, 30s, there gets to be a whole rage for black male cross-dressing entertainers. Um, I didn't find it so much in New Orleans, but there's a lot of writing about it in New York and Chicago. I assume it was happening in New Orleans as well. Um, how much of that, I mean, and a lot of that uh, for straight audiences and also straight white audiences. I mean, there was... It, it got referred to the Chicago Defender. I did a bunch of articles on the pansy craze. Um, I mean, one thing, of course, and if you've been in this history, you know this. Um, 
is the understanding of gayness was very different that i mean what what was performed was sissiness and there was a there was a world of straight men who would sleep with women or with sissies but regarded themselves as completely straight and maybe even hyper masculine uh certainly in the prostitution districts there were well, I mean, this has all been done very well by gay historians. In terms of the music, um, oddly enough, the explicit gay male stuff I found, none of it was blues. The explicit gay male stuff I found was um, rewrites of white pop material. And again, whether that is indicative of what was there or of what survives or just of what I've managed to find. I would, I tried to go deeper. I have a friend who has a friend in New Orleans whose grandfather, black friend, whose grandfather was gay and kept a journal. And boy, did I try to get my hands on that. Um, but I failed. I, I mean, I am quite sure that if, a black gay male scholar went into New Orleans, there is still a very, very deep memory there. And I would love to see what you could come up with. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, that answers my question. Thank you. Um, we have time for just this one last question um, from Danny, who also can't uh, unmute, so I'm gonna read her question. Um, Regarding censorship by uh, white record label owners, do you think more social critique and or protest songs, et cetera, were being performed live by male and female black blues artists for black audiences that were not recorded and released? And I think we could say the same about sheet music or folklorists um, on record labels, um, songs about racial oppression or sexism. Um, if so, have you come across evidence of all this in your research? Um. I mean, the very short answer is no. And that would not surprise me. Uh, I mean, I've gone to a lot of blues shows in black clubs, in black venues um, in my own lifetime where the politics is much more front and center and it rarely comes in in entertainment contexts. Uh, my impression is that that material tends to show up when entertainers are being asked to perform in explicitly political settings. Um, but if all they're doing is doing late night nightclub entertainment, which is what blues mostly was, uh, that's not what people want when they go out to be entertained in a nightclub. And that stuff was, in fact, more likely to be written for producers in New York with left-wing leanings than for crowds going out to party after a hard day's work. Uh, that doesn't mean that there weren't, you know, if somebody got shot by the police, I assume that people referred to it and sang about it. Um for that moment but also it wouldn't get recorded because again you know things get recorded because they're salable and i found this in the corrido world in mexico i mean if you can't get it out on the market with the week it happens you don't tend to have a market for topical material um so i'm not going to say there was no censorship but my own impression is that, you know, for example, Alan Lomax uh, was, if not a communist, a borderline communist. He was looking very hard for Black songs of protest um, and couldn't find a lot. And there was, and now I'm forgetting his name right now. Um, his brother was a famous communist artist, and he actually did find some Black songs of protest. But he was specifically asking for them. He, um, thank you, Lawrence Gellert. Thank you, Sana. Yes, 
Um, and Lawrence Gellert very much felt that the Lomaxes, you know, that, that people weren't being honest with the Lomaxes and that there was a lot more anger out there in songs that they weren't getting and that he got more of. And I mean, I'm sure there was anger. I mean, obviously. And, you know, there are some, you know, there's a song that I quote where a woman saying, you know, Black Maddie's got a baby, he's got blue eyes, must be that captain's been hanging around, which, you know, we, that's a Black woman's prison song. We're clearly talking about, you know, long histories of rape. Um, so, you know, clearly there is stuff out there. I, th yeah, I, th that ground has been much more trodden than other things because the search for songs of protest in working class, in folk culture has been a huge subject going back to the 1930s. You know, when the Communist Party was desperately looking for examples of proletarian protest art. Um, and some examples have been found, but mostly by people who were soliciting that. Great, thank you. Um, Elijah, I want to thank you so much and I want to thank Kim for being such a great conversational partner to you. And I want to thank everybody who came to hear you today and um, and go find the book, everyone. I'm stop yeah, and 